Hello, and welcome back to our webinar series where we discuss a number of topics related to medical cannabis. Today in our seventh episode, we're going to discuss the chemistry of cannabis, including cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, much of the medicinal profile of medical cannabis. And as with every episode, we always end with a question and answer session. So just to let you know a little bit about myself, my name is Barb Vermeulen. Over the last several years, I've developed patient care service departments and policy, and I'm currently involved at the clinic level, helping patients gain access, information, and support on all topics related to medical cannabis. I am joined today by my wonderful colleague and co-host, Jonathan Wierenski, and I'll let him introduce himself to you all. Hi, thank you, Barb. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jonathan. I lead up the cannabis counseling team at uh, Canadian Cannabis Clinics, and I serve as a subject matter expert. I specialized in pain management for 17 years, and I've studied cannabis for about 25 years. Please note, Barb and I are not physicians, and we're not providing specific medical advice during this webinar series. Okay, so the chemistry of cannabis, definitely a favorite subject of ours. So the benefits of understanding the chemical structure of cannabis cannot be overstated. To begin with, for prescribing practitioners and patients, understanding any medicine, of course, is crucial. Cannabis is an immensely complex plant made up of many chemical compounds. And we're going to cover a lot this evening. Some listeners may find it helpful to take a few notes as we go. Barb. Absolutely. So phytochemistry or plant chemistry of cannabis, it includes highly complex arrangements of hydrocarbons, sugars, mm. cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, fatty acids, and other constituent parts. Now, today we're going to talk about the chemistry of cannabis as it pertains to medicinal use and the unique combinations of some 144 cannabinoids and more than 400 other constituent parts, all of which combine and contribute to the entourage effect, the result of all of those parts working together in the body. So let's start out with the endocannabinoid system, and uh, of course that means receptors and cannabinoids. Yeah, and let's start briefly by looking at our own amazing human body, and then explain more specifically why cannabis works as medicine. So incredibly, there are 11 major organ systems that hopefully work together to contribute to us being healthy and well. These include, among others, the circulatory, immune, muscular, nervous, and skeletal systems. So science has known about these for quite some time, obviously, and they have each volumes of independent knowledge in med medical literature, uh, denoting our understanding of them. Uh, now, however, in 1990, a team that was led by Dr. L.A. Matsuda was researching how THC, the primary psychoactive compound in cannabis, affects the human body. And they discovered what soon came to be known as the endocannabinoid system, or the ECS. Uh, now, the endocannabinoid system is found inside the bodies of mammals. Uh, but it is particularly complex in the human body. It sure is. So what is this endocannabinoid system we talk about? It can best be described as a type of communication system between specialized molecules and receptors across various systems in the body. Evidence suggests that the endocannabinoid system helps regulate homeostasis, that's the body's pursuit of equilibrium, so that these systems function optimally. So the endocannabinoid system plays an important role in memory, mood, inflammation, sleep health, stress metrics, anxiety, and digestion, as well as pain modulation and appetite, Barb. So researchers are now looking really closely at the relationship between the endocannabinoid system and overall health. Uh, you'll often hear it described in terms of the tone of the ECS. Uh, optimal tone obviously leads to optimal well-being. It's also fascinating to note that just like our fingerprints, everyone's endocannabinoid system is different and unique. No two are the same, uh, not just in the number of receptors, but also where they're located within the body. Uh, now this could have a significant impact on an individual's overall health uh, and susceptibility as well to certain conditions. For example, patients with higher density of receptors within the body may find that they are actually more sensitive to particular cannabinoids. And other individuals, those who have a lower number of receptors uh, or perhaps suppressed production of endocannabinoids mm -hmm. may actually be considered cannabinoid deficient, which could be a contributing factor in chronic medical conditions. Yeah, and we've mentioned this before, but you can think of the relationship between cannabinoids and their receptors as a system of locks and keys. 
cannabinoid keys travel through the body and bind to the receptor or ox to create physiological change and facilitate a response in a cell and therefore its organ systems. So let's talk first about receptors. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two main types of cannabinoid receptors, those being the CB1 and CB2 receptors. CB1 receptors are most concentrated in cells of the brain, spinal cord, and central nervous system, but are found in lesser density in other parts of the body. CB1 receptors are associated to responses in memory and pain processing, among other things. And researchers do also believe that these receptors may be related to sleep and appetite modulation as well. Right, and a major trait of CB1 receptors is that they are the lock for the anandamide key, the endocannabinoid that is made inside our bodies. The psychoactive phytocannabinoid THC is the key for the cannabis plant that fits this lock, creating that feeling of being high, typically associated with cannabis use. So CB2 receptors, they're mostly located throughout the immune system and related organs, as well as connective tissue and glands. And they do occur in the brain, but to a lesser density than CB1 receptors. Yeah. And uh, the CB2 receptors, they've been found to be, uh, let's call it the gateway to reduction of inflammation and the repair of tissue damage. A primary and really important distinction between CB1 and CB2 receptors is that the THC phytocannabinoid molecule, that key, it doesn't unlock CB2 receptors. So it doesn't allow for that psychoactive effect. And this is why patients using um, uh, typically don't feel high or euphoric when they use low THC and high CBD strains. Uh, so now that we better understand how the uh, ECS receptors work, let's uh, maybe explore a cannabinoid molecule, what a, uh, a molecule actually is, or in this equation, uh, what those keys are. All right, so what is a cannabinoid? The cannabinoids, essentially, a class of diverse chemical compounds. The function of a cannabinoid, again, is to travel through the body and bind to the correct receptor, which then triggers a response in that cell and thus the cell's organ system. This response can be measured as therapeutic relief, like pain reduction, cessation of seizure activity, or sedation, for example. So Barb, where do they come from then? What are the source of cannabinoids? So there are three classifications of cannabinoids. There are endocannabinoids, phytocannabinoids, and synthetic cannabinoids. So endocannabinoids, or endogenous cannabinoids, they're cannabinoids that are actually manufactured inside and by the human body. Mm -hmm. uh, endo coming from the Latin word internal. Yeah, and most people are unaware that our own bodies even produce them. The two primary endocannabinoids made inside our body are anandamide and what's known as 2 arachidonoglycerol. So endocannabinoids, they're found at intersections of the body's various systems, uh, allowing communication and coordination between different cell types. Now, they're believed to be synthesized on demand rather than made and stored for later use. And researchers are probing ever deeper into the mechanisms that create endocannabinoids and also, too, to better determine their function within the body. Yeah. Phytocannabinoids, that being those found in plants, phyto from the Greek meaning plant, uh, phytocannabinoids are almost exclusively found in the cannabis plant. Although, as Barb and I were recently talk about, uh, talking about, it's, it's been found now in a, in a moss, too, a very similar That's molecule. right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's fascinating that these phytocannabinoids in the cannabis plant also fit CB1 and CB2 receptors inside our body, therefore affecting bodily functions. Over 144 phytocannabinoids have been isolated in the plant so far, and the most commonly known, of course, the study is the THC and CBD. And today also we're going to discuss the properties of other perhaps lesser known phytocannabinoids. Yeah. So but for synthetic cannabinoids, um, they'd be the third group of these molecules. And the synthetic cannabinoids are just that, compounds that have been created in a lab often based on the THC molecule. Synthetics were developed largely for research purposes, given that prohibition prevented researchers' access. Uh, and a common synthetic is a drug called nabilone. It's been prescribed since the mid-1980s to combat nausea as an appetite stimulant, help with pain. Absolutely. And, you know, one takeaway from all of this is that it really is quite remarkable uh, to discover mm -hmm. that the human body has evolved with a pre-existing system to facilitate cannabinoid creation, uh, regulation, and interaction. And among almost all of the four 400,000 species of plants on earth, mainly one in particular, the cannabis plant, produces these incredibly specialized molecules. So, so clearly an argument can be made that cannabinoids have a place in human bodily function. 
So let's move on now to looking at some specific cannabinoids and what they do. Yeah, so beyond THC and CBD. Now, during early episodes, you've heard us speak in depth about THC and CBD, the two primary cannabinoids associated with medical cannabis. So let's do a quick recap of those. Yeah, so Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, gives rise to the feelings of being high. THC is currently one of the most studied phytocannabinoids. And in terms of therapeutic value, THC has a long recognized uh, history of effectiveness in reducing nausea as an appetite stimulant, reducing intraocular pressure, but also prescribed for its role in pain relief and as a sleep aid and even to elevate mood. Some would argue that CBD or cannabidiol or cannabidiol uh, is surpassing THC no. with regard to interest from the medical and scientific community. Uh, researchers are now conducting large scale studies, uh, in depth studies to examine uh, in depth CBD's effectiveness as an analgesic, uh, an, anti an, an anti inflammatory, pardon me, and an anti seizure medication, uh, in addition to a number of other symptoms and conditions, uh, including sleep disorders, anxiety, PTSD, as well as neuro neurological disorders such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Uh, to learn more about this non-psychoactive cannabinoid, definitely we do encourage you yeah. to visit our episode three uh, webinar uh, where we focused uh, in depth on the science of CBD and potential benefits of that cannabinoid. Yep. Okay, so cannabigerol, CBG. This is a non-psychoactive phytocannabinoid that binds to both CB1 and CB2 receptors. It's usually found in small amounts, often less than 1% in the cannabis plant, but appears to play a major role in the overall effects of cannabis. And medicinally speaking, CBG definitely holds some very intriguing promise. Yeah, a 2014 study in fact demonstrated that CBG is considered one of the most powerful cannabinoids in programming uh, sorry, in facilitating programmed cell death of cancer cells and tumor growth in mouse models. So it's important to state that these are preliminary studies, of course, and cannot be viewed as a cure. Um, and researchers are also investigating CBG's role in addressing intraocular pressure, inflammation uh, as an anti, uh, antibacterial and for its neuroprotective properties. And I think you could definitely say, Barb, that this is like one of those cannabinoids to watch in terms of, uh, in terms of research coming down the pipe. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, again, it's very early days yet, and, uh, and certainly there are a lot of studies that are being conducted. Um, having access to regulated products certainly makes a difference, uh, so it'll be interesting to see what those studies yield. So, onwards to CBN, or mm -hmm. uh, cannabinol. Uh, now, that rarely exceeds more than 1% in dried flower cannabis, uh, but it's considered to be a major cannabinoid, actually. Uh, now, interestingly, CBN levels, they increase significantly when THC oxidizes over time, uh, degrades, and then converts to CBN. So a really good tip for you all, if you need cannabis medicine to help sleep, uh, having a supply of cannabis that's actually a couple of years old may be extremely useful. CBN is being investigated as an alternative to sleeping medications uh, and other potentially harmful and addictive pharmaceuticals. It may also be helpful in addressing pain and inflammation, as well as having antibacterial and appetite stimulating properties. Yeah. And now, uh, cannabichromine, uh, CBC, yet another promising non-psychoactive phytocannabinoid. CBC has been found to have an effect on the perception of pain, as well as the ability to stimulate production of endocannabinoids within the body. And CBC is also being investigated not only for its singular benefits used alone, but for its ability to work in conjunction with other cannabinoids contributing to that entourage effect. We'll get into that more in, in detail later in this episode. Uh, and CBC also exhibits powerful anti-inflammatory properties and seems to uh, suppress excessive lipid production in sebaceous glands, which may be useful in the treatment of chronic acne and other skin system conditions. So apart from phytocannabinoids, another major player in the cannabis story are terpenes. Uh, terpenes are now being further investigated for their therapeutic properties and how they interact with cannabinoids within the body. Uh, so what is a terpene? Uh, terpenes and terpenoids are a large and diverse class of organic compounds produced by a variety of plants and even some insects. Even some insects, it's fascinating. Many individuals have come to recognize the benefits of individual terpenes as evidenced by the popularity of use of essential oils for their therapeutic value. And some terpenes promote relaxation, stress relief, and while others may be more energizing and help promote mental focus. 
And to date, over 200 terpenes have been identified uh, that may occur in the cannabis plant. And every strain of cannabis has its own unique combination and concentration of terpenes, which creates a diverse palette and range. So from the blueberry mm -hmm. to piney yeah. uh, to lemon, uh, cheese, uh, skunk, diesel, yep. and pineapple characteristics, and of course, where those strain names get their names from, in case you'd ever wondered, mm -hmm. uh, it is from their terpene profiles that cannabis can have. Yeah. And it Additionally, you know, it's very important, besides affecting the aroma and flavor, there is evidence suggesting that they may also be modifying the effects of cannabis in the body. So let's take a look at some of the most commonly found terpenes in cannabis and how they may have a positive therapeutic effect. Okay, so we're going to start off with myrcene, yeah. uh, because myrcene is among the most prevalent terpene, and it's found in most varieties of cannabis. Uh, its presence and concentration actually may have a significant impact on whether a cannabis strain is considered uh, more calming, more relaxing, or sedative, uh, or if it's energizing. So myrcene occurs in highly fragrant plants like thyme, hops, citrus, and basil, and it's often used in aromatherapy. And another place you'll find uh, myrcene is in mangoes. Of course, and so mangoes, uh, mm -hmm. anyone who who is familiar with cannabis uh, certainly has been told or told this story. Uh, certainly anecdotal evidence, it, it suggests that eating a ripe mango prior to consuming cannabis, it may accentuate or extend the psychoactive effects of cannabis. Uh, and this is possibly due to the fruit's concentrations of myrcene. Uh, it's naturally synergistic with THC and allows cannabinoids to uh, more easily bridge the blood-brain barrier. Uh, apart from its uh, sedative properties, myrcene also displays anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antibiotic, and anti-mutagenic properties as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, pinene. Um, pinene accounts for much of the familiar scent of the cannabis plant itself. Uh, that, that It's often associated with a piney, turpentiney type of smell. Um, Absolutely. And it can also, though, be found in rosemary and dill and mm -hmm. parsley. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's definitely among the most commonly naturally occurring terpenoids. And uh, it's been found to offer a number of health benefits, including acting as an anti-inflammatory, as many others do, but also as a bronchodilator, as well as reducing short-term memory loss and promoting alertness and focus. So the presence of pinene can depend on a number of factors outside of genetic makeup and things like grow medium, flowering time, and the curing process are all gonna, all gonna factor into that. So terpinaline. Uh, mm. Terpinaline is an interesting one, interesting one. It's found in fragrant plants, uh, including nutmeg, tea tree, and apples and lilacs. Uh, again, has a very piney floral and herbal flavor profile. And because of that, it's often used in soaps and perfumes and lotions. Um, now, terpinaline has been shown to exhibit antioxidant uh, and anti-cancer effects in rat brain cells. Uh, now, again, these are early, very preliminary, preliminary studies that needs to be um, uh, said. In uh, mouse models. Absolutely, in yeah. mouse models. And studies with mice do show Show that terpinaline has a sedative effect when it's inhaled. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, okay, so limonene, um, this is one of the more widely used terpenes, long history of medical benefits and applications. As the name suggests, this citrusy terpene is most commonly found in the peels of citrus plants. It's studied for its effects on mood, depression, anxiety, as well as other conditions and symptoms. And limonene, interestingly enough, is what gives uh, cannabis strains like sour tangy or super lemon haze, uh, their very punchy sort of citrusy flavor. Yeah, and it also improves the uh, absorption of other terpenes, making it yet another player in the uh, entourage effect. That's very, in that's, uh, that's very important, that one. We'll probably reference that again later in the, uh, in the broadcast. Indeed. So linalool. Uh, linalool, it is a naturally occurring terpene, of course, found in many flowers and spices, and most notably uh, lavender and coriander. Uh, now, throughout recorded history, there's been documentation of humans inhaling the scent of certain plants, uh, including many containing linalool, often to help lower stress levels or fight inflammation, which makes sense. When you smell yeah. nice things, you, you, um, you feel different, uh, or you may feel energized. Uh, now, of course, um, linalool in particular possesses sedative properties, and it is an effective anxiety and stress reliever. There was a 2009 right. study in rat models uh, that observed reduction of stress markers when the animals were exposed by inhalation to linalool, uh, while also to being simultaneously exposed to stressful conditions. 
So last but not least, and again, last I'm going to couch that because there are so many, so I wish we yeah. could talk about all of them <laughs> today, yeah. uh, but caryophylline. Uh, caryophylline is another very common cannabis terpene. It's regarded to have anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety, and analgesic properties, uh, and may um, is, it may be and is being studied mm -hmm. for um, its aid in perhaps reducing alcohol cravings, mm -hmm. uh, which is very fascinating. It's found in black pepper and cloves and cinnamon, among other examples, and, and so consequently has a very sort of spicy, peppery profile. Uh, now, caryophylline binds to CB2 receptors, and it often does appear in anti-inflammatory topicals and salves. So. Yeah, and you know, both of us can speak personally to, um, to patients over the years who have battled alcoholism and things, and, and they have found cannabis to be such a, such a, you know, a good way to transition away from that. Absolutely. Okay, so that covers some of the main terpenes, Barb. Let's touch on another set of compounds in cannabis, the flavonoids. And there's increased interest in the role that flavonoids play in the makeup and therapeutic attributes of cannabis. The word flavonoid comes from the Latin flavus, and the primary function of these cap, uh, compounds is to provide color pigmentation to plants, flowers, edible fruits, vegetables. This can play a role as well in visually distinguishing uh, the features that differentiate traits between cannabis strain varieties as well. Yeah. Canaflavin A is pharmacologically active. It's an anti-inflammatory. It has been investigated as a powerful alternative to aspirin. Canaflavin B and C are also being studied for their potential medical benefits. And there are many more highly active flavonoid uh, found in cannabis, um, some with the potential as an anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antioxidant, and perhaps, yes, even some anti-cancer properties. So, as you said a moment ago, the entourage effect, where it all comes together, Barb. And, and this is now where things get very interesting. Yeah. As researchers have learned more about how each group functions individually to provide therapeutic value, evidence now suggests that they also interact synergistically with each other uh, to produce the entourage effect that we have spoken so much about tonight and also to in previous episodes. Uh, now, the entourage effect is defined as a positive therapeutic result by way of combining two or more medicinal compounds. Now, due to the many, many, many active ingredients in the cannabis plant, mm -hmm. um, this certainly can be a very complex map uh, to chart out indeed. And, and you know, research again is really only just beginning to uncover the relationships between individual cannabinoids, terpenes, and, and flavonoids. And that being said, there are certainly a few examples that we can cite here. For instance, one of the first and most common ones is the synergistic effect that THC and CBD can have when combined in those balance, those one-to-one -one ratio products we spoke about. Um, so many patients who may not respond to C CBD only uh, products often find relief with just a small amount of THC added into the picture. And patients report often that THC seems to kickstart, if you will, the effects of the CBD product. And studies are also investigating CBD as a modulator of THC at the blood brain barrier, reducing in some cases, negating the psychoactive effects of feeling high that THC produces. And as we mentioned before, uh, the terpene myrcene, it's often cited as having a noted effect, again, at the blood brain, brain barrier with regard to THC absorption, uh, essentially enhancing the psychoactive experience. Now, researcher Ethan Russo has put forth evidence suggesting that pinene helps to counteract, uh, counteract compromised cognition, cognition sorry, and memory uh, that is caused by THC use. Uh, perhaps a combination of terpenes, pinene, myrcene, and caryophylline may help to unravel anxiety. Yeah. Uh, THC plus CBN seems to yield enhanced sedating effects. Limonene, again, is exceptional in that it improves the absorption of other terpenes. So now, again, that researchers have greater access to, to standardized and regulated cannabis, it really is only a matter of time, likely, until greater therapeutic values are revealed. Fine. Finally, and it's just so exciting. Okay, so we have also spoken of whole plant medicine. What is this whole plant medicine? So what we're referring to here is not so much the physical plant itself in that the, the leaves, the roots and flowers, etc., but rather the whole array of these chemical compounds and how they interact in the near endless combinations. 
Traditionally, cultivators and plant scientists focused primarily on maximizing THC content, shorter flowering times, and hardiness in their plants. Absolutely, but now this focus has become extremely scientific and sophisticated, with strains being developed and bred with very, very specific terpene, uh, flavonoid, and cannabinoid profiles. And with this comes the development of symptom-specific strains tailored with precise po uh, profiles to manage, you know, say, anxiety or alleviate pain or for sedative properties. And that list of possibilities just goes on and on. And now we discussed this in our previous uh, episode number four when we talked about cannabis oils. Uh, another really important development um, in, in cannabinoid medicine is the development of ever more sophisticated and effective extraction techniques. Uh, nowadays, terpenes and cannabinoids and flavonoids, they can be isolated, actually taken out of the plant uh, and then recombined in very specific combinations, uh, let's say in an oil product perhaps. Uh, that again, is designed to target very specific symptom sets. Um, what can be taken away from this, for sure, is that the future of cannabis medicine, it has moved to a completely other level now. It's extremely promising and increasingly broad in its scope. Absolutely. So I think the last thing on everyone's mind uh, is probably, well, where do I find these strains and how do I get this information? Yeah. So to bring this home to how all this science and the chemistry of cannabis relates to you, the patient, Cannabinoid therapy is highly individualized to each person. It's why we want to empower you, the patient, with information so that you can find the best possible products and combinations of products to meet your individual needs. And the most reliable place to start looking for cannabis with accurate and specific cannabinoid terpene profiles is via clinic and a licensed producer. And that's regulated medicine. Absolutely. So we, we do mention this often, but legally sourced cannabis from a licensed producer, it is currently the, the only rigorously tested and accurately labeled product. Uh, you generally will not get a reliable profile uh, of, of can cannabinoids and, and terpenes from, uh, let's say, a black market dealer or an illegal dispensary. Uh, your best bet is to begin by researching the cannabinoids that may have a positive effect on your condition, uh, and then check and reference your licensed producer's product information to determine what strains and products contain those relevant profiles for you. And this information is generally represented like a, an easy chart or a graphic right on the LP's online shop or a link to a lab report from, from that uh, for particular lots of cannabis. And they're listing the percentage of the relevant terpenes and cannabinoids. And of course, our counselors can help you navigate your way through the products available, um, the, um, the many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds across the country, based on the specific profiles of cannabinoids and terpenes, for example. Absolutely. And you know, we're always here to help. And speaking of helping, uh, I do think that it's it's definitely time we open up the floor to our question and answer section. Yeah, and as always, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, you will be receiving an email with a response from our help team. And you can also reach out to us at webinar at canvasrx.com with any further questions. So let's get started, Barbara. Okay, I have a question here from Lauren. Uh, and Lauren is trying cannabis for the first time for migraine headaches. Uh, and she would like to know um, uh, what the most likelihood of success with cannabis cannabis would be. Uh, and uh, she says that her migraines are triggered by food quite often. Uh, and, uh, and she says that she does not obviously want to wake up with a headache the next day. Uh, so that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I've, I've um, counseled um, quite a few patients and spoken with a lot of patients who did, for varying reasons, have um, issues with migraines. Uh, and of course, everyone does have a unique and differing reaction to cannabis. And this can also be quite strain specific. Um, in the past, the migraine patients that I've spoken with, they often have used a low THC, high CBD strain. And Jonathan, I see you nodding here. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> uh, or also to a, a balanced one-to-one -one product. Uh, again, quite with some success. Uh, now, in some cases, certainly as well, I have spoken with patients who have said that a higher THC, uh, sativa-based strain may also be helpful. Um, it, it's really tough to say. Um, inhaling cannabis with a vaporizer, often very careful with quick onset relief, uh, where using oils and edible products might offer longer term relief over a few hours. Uh, you know, and that being said, um, I always say to patients, if you're not sure, um, definitely do speak with your physician yeah. uh, and discuss your options uh, because again, it, it can vary from person to person. Huge. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think you covered that really well. Thanks. <laughs> next. Uh, what do we got next? What do we got next? Do you want to take one? Oh, you know what? We got a question from Stephen here we were talking about earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now. Yeah. 
So Stephen writes in, he says, um, when I was first, it's a bit long, I'm trying to shorten this down just a little bit, but I think it can capture where Stephen's coming from. He was first prescribed cannabis. He thought it'd be very quick, you know, figuring out the process, determine your THC, get some CBD in there, place an order, everything, you know, should fall into place. And, you know, indeed for many people that can happen. Um, so he says, you know, he couldn't order anything for a while and he, he's really looked into things and he's determined that he wants more information with regards to terpenes and, and, and trying to figure out exactly how the terpene profiles can fit into matching his therapeutic goals and 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 he also speaks to the fact that you know in displaying things like like terpenes there really isn't any standardization and you know i think that's another one of those things that in time eventually this can all fall into place but we find ourselves where we are where we are so i think steve's comments and questions are exemplary of much of the state of cannabis research right now at present where sound evidence informed answers aren't always right there right and there's always more questions that come from those answers absolutely <laughs> and you know what we got to say is anecdotal personal claims even stack floor to ceilings do not equate to the findings of quality research and with cannabis comes a lot of anecdote so we will see patients try a variety of things journal results in fact that's something we highly encourage but journaling and it can be a lot of exploration a lot of the variables right and for others more trial and error is is a factor and for others still although something of a minority i would say uh, currently some others still want to investigate much more deeply such as what steven's looking for here and i encourage that type of personal research i, I think you know it's great need to share the knowledge um, but some people they will try a little blind sampling of their various products, right? Hide the label and see if you can determine which the product was by the effects alone. Uh, and many people will say that it's not what they anticipated. So, you know, much of the information gathered on a site like Leafly, it, it is based on a lot of anecdotal experience too. And, you know, you may see a variety of terpenes listed, but we're, we're, we're not at the point where we can necessarily line up full profiles of these various chemi chemicals, uh, these compounds in cannabis to align to very specific therapeutic goals and conditions. We're getting there. And I think as you allude to the research that's coming down the pipe, is that clearly defining that more. But at this point, a lot more questions than answers. Absolutely. I mean, standardization is something that I think that every grower seeks to achieve. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, they are plants and you can control every variable. Uh, and yeah. at the end of the day, I'd be very I, surprised. I've certainly been quoted saying the plan is going to do what the plan is going to do, but within a range, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, uh, and, and still at the end of the day, I, I still think just to answer Steve's question, I think mm. your best bet still, if you want yeah. the most yeah. accurate and up-to-date information on a strains, terpene and, and cannabinoid profile, uh, it is going to be on the website of the, the company that's, that's selling and growing the product. The LP themselves. Uh, because um, it, it does have to go through a very specific set of lab tests uh, that are very consistent. Uh, and yeah. so that's really where you're going to find your, your best information there. Yeah, I hope that information helps, Stephen. Thank you very much for submitting a, a great question there. There's I, a lot to it. Yeah, I saw a question that I want to address only because mm -hmm. we alluded to it a little bit earlier in the webcast, and I think it's something that's really important to discuss. Uh, we got a, a question in um, uh, that uh, where uh, the patient is saying that she is interested in using cannabis to cure her alcohol addiction. Oh, yes. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, the wording um, that she's sending yep. in. What and how should I be using? Uh, and, and she is currently using cannabis for, for pain and sleep so oil. already is using an oil yeah. um you know and that's a, a great question and, yeah. and one that i'm very personally um sort of attached to and mm. and cannabis as a method of harm reduction it is a very relatively new um and, and very promising field of research but it comes again couched in in in, in caution uh and and needs mm -hmm. to be very um carefully handled um now that being said i'm very very glad that this person is responding well to cannabinoid treatment in yeah. general it sounds like it's working um there certainly are a number of thoughts and concerns related to using cannabis to treat addiction. Yeah. Uh, some experts um, in the field, doctors, will approach this idea with great, great caution because there is the opinion uh, that an individual may be trading one dependence for another. Uh, certainly that is a legitimate concern. Um, now others do feel that cannabis may be less detrimental to health yeah. than alcohol uh, and therefore um, uh, perhaps a safer substitute. Uh, again, uh, you know, the jury is, is really out on that. Um, cannabis certainly is being studied as an aid for those who are uh, alcohol dependent in the tapering off period. Uh, and it certainly is considered safer than, let's say, benzodiazepines, which may be prescribed. Yeah. And another important factor, I think, to consider there is the root cause of alcoholism. 
and many who are alcohol dependent may be self-medicating to cope with other underlying things, anxiety, depression, PTSD, right? So um, using cannabis to address these mental health issues instead may be effective in reducing an individual's needs to self-medicate. Exactly. And again, you know, when we get to cannabis and mental health, uh, you know, this again is, is a very, um, uh, it's a very challenging topic to address because again, there are certain diagnoses uh, and certain individuals where cannabis just is, is not uh, an effective um, uh, means of treating anything. Uh, so again, you know, if you are looking to um, uh, um, address addiction or dependency issues, uh, we will always say um, under the, the guidance of the physician, go yeah. see your doctor yeah. uh, and, and have, a, have a discussion because it's a great step to be taking and, and I think it's um, really important to discuss. And I wish you all the power on that journey. Absolutely. So where are we next? We think, I think we've got time for at least one more. Well, you had picked out, uh, oh, I'm going to take one. Yes. I got a question from Max here. So Max writes and he says, I'm wondering what I need to do in order to get a prescription because I have multiple sclerosis and my doctors don't want to prescribe cannabis, even though it's legal in Canada now. Let me know your thoughts. Um, do you want to start with that one, Barb? Um, Yes. Uh, so no, I didn't mean to throw in the slide. I said I would take it. <laughs> you did, and now you got your mouth going. So let me, let, 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 yeah, sure. Let me speak to Max here. So um, if, if, if you'd like access to, to medical cannabis, you can do so without the direct involvement of your physician by doing a self-referral to one of our, our clinics and simply visit our, our website at cannabisclinics.ca. Um, so you complete a self-referral form. It allows us to contact your physician to request some medical documents, some of your medical chart um, that speaks to the condition you're seeking to be treated and the, the, the symptoms of MS. Uh, and and um, so even if your physician is not on board with the referral, they're still obliged to provide the information information from your chart uh, to, the, to, to, to us in this case, uh, if you're coming to our clinic. And, and this will then allow our physicians to assess you directly for cannabis use. Of course, MS is definitely one of the most common diagnoses we see in our clinics. Barb and I recently yeah, did, a, did a webinar for the MS Society of Canada. Um, and there's also our home care option now, right? We've got a great service. It's been going for a while and it's going strong. And if you prefer having your appointment online, you can stay in the comfort of your own home and we can do it over a, a special uh, encrypted video call. So, and there's a reasonable fee for that, but many find, patients find it like less than the gas and the parking anyway. So uh, it can be super convenient uh, to to to, to not have to have an actual appointment in the yeah. clinic. But yeah, for sure, Max, self-referral, no problem. Just pop over to our website, Cannabis Clinics. We would never want to say you should not have your family doctor on board, but some of them just plain simply aren't. So even if they aren't, you can still get the right. But we, we always encourage communication and making trying to hope that everybody is on board for that, that part of your treatment regime. Awesome. I think I'm going to try and squeeze one more in. I'm sorry, I have to do it. Uh, it is from Dale. Uh, he says that he's presently taking sublingual spray from Hexo for arthritis. Uh, he's doing four sprays twice a day. Uh, it says it doesn't last long, um, uh, long enough. It doesn't quite stop the pain, but it helps to cope and work through the pain. Uh, now, this is um, a really good thing to hear. Uh, now, Dale also says he notices a difference if he doesn't take it, um, but has stomach issues, and so really is limited to the spray in an oil product. Uh, so um, he kind of wanted to know if there were any other products that might perhaps be, um, uh, be suitable. Uh, and certainly reading this, I've got a few things that come to mind. Um, I certainly would that again I could say that cannabis treatment is a cure-all and it takes away all the pain and the symptoms um, but it just does not work like that mm -hmm. uh, you know um, it, it would be great if cannabis was a magic bullet and a cure-all but for most people it does come down to symptom management uh, now it sounds to me like if you're taking a dosage twice a day certainly increasing the dosage up to a third one uh, you may notice um, a very noticeable effect well within uh, range. again and totally within range um, again what cannabis product that is a tough one uh, because what we've learned is again people with the same diagnosis using the exact same cannabis often do have very very different results uh, there are a number of factors at play, your unique endocannabinoid system diet, other medications. Um, so I think um, it looks like Dale's been using a balanced product and certainly could shop around. Um, but of course, the spray, not a lot of companies um, do sell a spray, but there's a way around this and you've you figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. I mean, one can take their oil and buy a simple you know, kitchen grade oil atomizer and administer it themselves. I want to caution 
You want to take it really, really light, very small, start low, go slow. So think about how you're going to do this, depending on what type of container you buy. But you can make your own atomizer. You can you know, use your own atomizer with your own oil. Absolutely. So, so that would then allow Dale, let's say, to try other yeah. oils from other companies mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and see uh, what products may work And you know, Barb, I got to say, this is not to compare buying an atomizer to the actual products that are at LPs that are sprays, yes. which are they're really, really good products. Oh, yeah. Um, but you, you can do this as a delivery method, yeah, for sure. There, there, is, there is a workaround there. Yep. Uh, so again, it is possible to buy an edible oil product, buy uh, an oil atomizer and try, uh, try it that way. So I uh, think that kind of wraps us up for our questions here. Uh, let me just Good luck here. with the arthritis. I share yeah, that one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that brings us to our conclusion tonight. As always, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, you can revisit this and our other webinars by doing a search on YouTube, again, for Cannabis Clinic uh, webinar. Yeah, and I just want to say thanks as always to the man sitting beside me here, VJ, running our production and technicalities, and to Skylar sitting on the other side of the studio. And I'll direct everybody to the uh, study citations in our final slide there, just to make sure if you're looking for one, some of the information that we have sourced this evening, there it is all listed conveniently for you. Perfect. And we're going to see you on November 28th yeah. at 7.30 for our next webinar. Uh, we're going to be discussing arthritis symptoms and medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. So all of you out there who may be living with arthritis and related symptoms, uh, please uh, do feel free. Or if you know anyone, let them know. We'll be yeah. talking about that in detail. And we're talking about our osteoarthritis, our rheumatoid arthritis, our psoriatic arthritis, our ankylosing spondylitis, other spondylopathy, et cetera, et cetera. We're thinking about inflammatory conditions as opposed to uh, where it applies to joints, but also also, you know, in inflammation in general with respect to cannabis. So I can tell we're going to have a lot to talk about. You that. know that one. <laughs> okay. Barb, Thank you so, so much. Bye-bye.